so anyway, like I was saying, thank you so much for your grace, your patience, and I'll say your kindness. Um, right now, you just saw two thirds of our team. So if you do the math, that leaves two extra people. So thank you so much for your patience, but welcome to ISCB's town hall. We wanted to make this creative. We wanted to make this interactive um, because we stole the mic from there. When you have a question at any point during this presentation, just kind of stand up, give us a wave, shout your question. We'll repeat the question in the mic and then we'll continue on. Um, I, per ISCB's uh, bylaws, we are required as a professional organization to officially post this agenda for you today. So here's our agenda. This is what we're going to do. I'm just doing your welcome and your order. Janet Kelso, our treasurer. Oh, I'm going to announce the board of directors. That's exciting. Um, Janet Kelso, our treasurer, is going to do our official treasury and membership report as of the audited um, approved results from 2021. She'll also talk a little bit about what 2022 is looking like and some of our endeavors moving forward. And then we're going to bring up Christina Rango to do a little interview with her, um, followed by Lucio Pichotto to talk about our equity, diversity, inclusion initiatives and answer some of the questions that we've been seeing on Twitter about why we're doing what we're doing. Then the exciting ISCB bioinformatics advances. Yes, after nine years, we did it. Thomas and Alex are here to give us the report on how well that's going. And then uh, our cozies and then finally our student council. So please do stick around because the student council has a lot of amazing information to report. And for the PIs in the room, some great opportunities for you students for your students to get involved. So drum roll, please. Oh, thank you. I love it. I love it. Um, the board of directors yesterday at our, our July board of directors meeting elected five new members of the board who will start their term in January 2023. And they are Bruno Gieta, Nomi Harris, Thomas Lingauer, Alejandra Medina Rivera, and Zhugong Zhang. So congratulations to them. It was an extremely hard election this year. We had 17 candidates and only five positions. So you can imagine the type of deliberation and it, it was a lengthy deliberation. So for those who did put forth your name and you were not selected, I strongly encourage you to try again. We always need bright new ideas on the board and um, there is a rotational pattern. So these individuals will serve a three year term, um, two of which three of which will then actually turn out. So in their next rotation, we'll have three brand new openings. All right, so Janet, are you here? I'm here, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry, Janet, yes, we can hear you, but you can't hear them shouting yes back at me. I'm going to start sharing a screen, is that okay? Yes, Janet, share your screen and I'm going to get you on this screen. Okay. Shout when I can go ahead. Okay. All right, Janet, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So as Diane said, Janet, she's really hanging in there. <laughs> so as Diane said, there are some parts of this meeting that are absolutely required to you for you to, to hear. And one of those things is the treasurer's report. And I don't want to drag it out too long. What I'd like to do this evening is just give you an overview of the finances and the membership of ICB, um, which gives you some idea of the state of the society. And that's important because the finances of the society support the day-to-day -day running of the society, as well as all the various activities, like the international and, and the regional and the specialist meetings, um, regional affiliated groups, the student council, all the different things that you're hearing about, that you will hear about through the rest of this meeting. 
And so starting with a very high level overview of the financial position of the society, and I hope you can see my mouse. Um, as of, uh, you'll see here, the end of May 2022, what you can see is that the current assets of the society are just under $3 million. And approximately 2 million of that, this total equity amount down here, is effectively the available resources for the society. And if you look here in the investments, you'll see that the vast majority of the, the society's current assets, a little over 2 million, is currently held in investments. And investing the income of the society, money that the society had accrued over many years, was a decision that was made a couple of years ago by the then board of directors with an explicit aim to build up reserves that would allow the society to bridge any financial crises that may come along and also to be able to invest in new programs and things like that. And that turned out to be quite prescient. Um, the in investments performed very well, and it turns out to have really been a wise move. Um, as you can see here, and as you probably have all guessed already, the gross revenue of the society dropped dramatically in 2020 and in 2021. Um, in both those years, you'll see down here at the bottom, the society op operated as, at a substantial loss, a loss of almost $200,000 in 2020 and about 100000 in 2021. And that was due, of course, to the fact that um, because of the pandemic, we haven't been able to hold in-person meetings. Our main meeting, ISMB, is one of the main sources of income for the society. And we've therefore been really fortunate that we had this investment reserve that we could dip into um, and together with a number of cost-cutting efforts that Diane and her team have put in place, we've been able to bridge these last two years and to keep the society operating without too much of an impact on our programs. And I think that's quite an achievement and, and it's something that um, a few years ago we wouldn't have been able to do. So thanks to the previous board members who thought about this and, and put us in a position to survive this crisis. Looking in a little bit more detail, you can see here that the general operations of the society, the day-to-day -day running of the society, um, is sort of a, a relatively flat amount, around $400,000 a year. And the programs, which you see down here, there's all the activities of the society, the things that, that I talked about, like outreach and education and, and student councils and things like that. That's a commitment of the society currently of around 100000 a year. And so running the society you know, just in terms of output costs, um, not thinking about meetings or fundraising, it costs us about five to six hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, and the, then on the other side of the, the conferences and the fundraising, which are quite dynamic, the, the intention of them is to bring in income to the society and to support the activities. And so um, the main source of income for operations has always been membership revenue. So, so the membership um, part that's paid to the society is used to run the day-to-day -day operations of the society. And as I said to you, that operational cost is around $400,000 a year. You can see that we're not quite reaching that at the moment with our current membership. Membership has decreased since 2019. Um, and we know that that is linked to the meeting. We know that people register largely um, when they're going to attend a meeting because they get a substantial meeting discount. And so we know that um, our membership numbers um, have dropped in the last years. And I'll show you a little bit more about the membership at the end. What we're able to do at the moment is supplement the income for um, supporting our operations with um, income we have coming from a job center board that ISCB uh, runs um, and from the fees that we charge to manage finances for other conferences. So we have other so, so, so smaller sources of income that allow us to sort of keep the operations running. The, in, the source of income for ISCB programs, or the primary source, is conferences, primarily ISMB. And as you can see um, here in the bottom row, the income from ISMB during 20 and 20, 2020 and 2021 was really a tiny fraction of what it's been in, in previous years. Um, the switch to virtual meetings, which we achieved quite quickly and, and now to hybrid meetings has been a real challenge to navigate and there are many associated new costs with having both virtual meetings and hybrid meetings and one of the important considerations that the board held in mind during this time was that we should keep 
th that we should try and keep the registration for the virtual attendance low. And, and we chose in 2020 and again in 2021 to cover the shortfall from the investment reserves rather than passing on the costs um, associated with the online platforms to attendees. A more positive direction is the, um, the first year of our journal, um, Bioinformatics Advances, has already been really successful. The journal's attracted a good number of really excellent papers and um, has actually exceeded the income that we projected for its first year, bringing in just over $30,000 in 2021. And so this is sort of the part of our, our strategy to diversify um, the income sources for our programs and, and reduce the society's dependence on ISMB as the, the only source of income for our programs. And so I guess the challenges that, that we face currently are, are that in 2022, we are still operating at a deficit. It's likely that at the end of this year, we will still see a net loss. We're lucky. Our investments give us a buffer to cover this, and they allow us to continue to operate the society and to support and even grow some of our programs. However, in the first half of this year, the markets where our investments are sitting have, have also performed poorly, and, and we've lost um, about $250,000 in investments early this year. So continuing to draw heavily on investments is therefore not at, at, not at all sustainable in the longer term. We're going to have to think carefully how we diversify our sources, sources of income. That's something that the board and the CEO are already working on. Um, as I said, bioinformatics advances is, is one of those things. There are others, sponsorships, advertising, uh, other ways of fundraising, the career center. We're also thinking very carefully about how future meetings should be run. Um, number one, so that we don't operate at a loss as we have in, in past years and that we don't have to dip into our, into our reserves, but also because um, we think that hybrid conferences are an excellent way to make our meetings more accessible to a wider audience, but they're also much more expensive than having either an in-person meeting or an online-only meeting. And so we have to figure out how, to, how we can run them um, cost-effectively. As members, there are a number of quite simple ways that you can help the society. You can renew your membership. That's really important. And also encourage others to renew their membership, including our new kinds of memberships, which are for labs and for institutions. And then, of course, by attending conferences like this one, um, either virtually or in person. As I said, I just want to jump to a quick comment on membership, just so that you see what our membership looks like. And you can see, so what we have here are membership in different categories. Um, in purple, the total membership. In blue, professional members, which are our largest group. In green, student members, which are our second largest group. And in red, postdocs, our, our smallest group. And I think what's immediately obvious is that membership in all categories dipped substantially in 2020, and that none of them have yet recovered to the, to the membership levels that we had um, in 2019. There is a good upward trend here in 2022, and that's largely, I think, due to this meeting, this in-person meeting. Um, if we break this down by region, what you can see is that it's almost certainly due to this meeting because you can see that the largest growth has been in North America, whereas, in fact, we still um, have a, a sinking number of members in Europe and in Africa and in Oceania. Um, we know, as I said earlier, that our, our membership um, subscriptions are tied to where the meeting is. So we would expect that next year when the meeting goes to Europe, that this would flip around and we would see again an increase in European membership. But as I said, maintaining and, and encouraging new members is a really important way in which um, you can support the society. And I think just to summarize, I'm kind of coming to the end now. Um, the society is in a relatively stable financial position. We're lucky. We have the, we've, we're lucky, and, and 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 we thought in advance, and and we have the cash reserve that we can keep our heads above water. We hope that in the year ahead, that membership begins to recover, and that meetings will grow again. Um, we also know that there's an important need to think about how how ISCB funds its operations and programs, and and to consider how we run our meetings. Um, keeping two things in mind, increasing accessibility for all our members worldwide is a priority for our meetings, and also finding ways to allow our members to make choices um, 
about how they attend meetings while reducing their carbon footprint. I'm very happy to take questions at this point. Uh, Jenna, thank you so very much. At this time, do we have any questions for Madam Treasurer? That's kind of fun to say, Madam President, Madam Treasurer, Madam CEO. No one? All right, so we'll just continue to move on to our agenda. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Christina Rinko to the stage. The tech moderator is going to help me out here. Uh, Jana, can you stop sharing your, sharing your screen for us? Sure. Uh, how do I do that? <laughs> I thought I had. <laughs> I'm, I'm no longer sharing according to my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, this one's on. It used to be on. Oh, good heavens. All right. So, anyway, hey, Christine, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm fine. So, I want to ask you what can ISCB do for these guys out in the audience? Okay. So, so. This is an interview, but I kind of cheated a bit because <laughs> I'm making pictures, so I'm going to show just a few images. Um, but, but I also want to remind you about what the society does already because it, it does a lot. Um, Janet already gave us some ideas. Um, so I just have a list of some of the things, the conferences you know about already. Some of you are here at the big, the main conference we have, but there are many others. The communities, you know about those because you've been sitting in those meetings all day. We have 21 of them now. So um, do we expand them? What can we do? Uh, I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, you also hopefully have seen some of the webinars, and we hope that some of you will, will give webinars. Um, that's something else that we do and that hopefully you can contribute to. And you're going to hear about the journal later on. We have a jobs board. We have training material. We have all kinds of guidelines on how to in, help your institute become much more diverse, how to become more green yourself. Um, so there's a lot of things we're doing, but we need to do a lot more, and we need you to help us do that. So uh, I think I'm going to move on to this, because what we really would like is that the society becomes a kind of web of connectivity, that the society can do, I mean, this is you, you're the society, that we can do more to connect with each other and collaborate with each other. I think COVID's been a fantastic example of how important collaboration is. I mean. Obviously, competition is important in science, it drives new ideas, but collaboration is also important and valuable. And we've seen through the vaccines and therapeutics how fantastic it's been for groups all around the world uh, to collaborate with each other. So we, we want to somehow bring about more of that with your help. We have, I mean, Janet's shown you the financial position, we have a tiny team, we don't have a lot of money to. Uh, set up new activities, you need volunteers for that. And I'm just going to give a couple of slides just uh, uh, on ideas for that. One thing we really care about is to try and make these communities that you're, you're all part of, I hope. And if you've not found a home in one of these communities, um, please let us know because that's a scientific theme or some kind of scientific enabling activity that we haven't recognized yet. And we'd be really grateful for volunteers for people from this audience who 
or of anything else we've missed, who might be willing to give up their, their time to set up something like that. But you notice in red, I put there, what we want to do is keep those communities active throughout the year. Uh, we want to nourish them. We, we want ISCB to be more than ISNB in its conferences. We want ISCB to be a set of communi communities that, that, that connect and collaborate. And uh, again, because I just think in images, I just, some things that we can do. Actually, I was talking to one of the com community organizers this morning, Rafi on 3D6, and saying, well, what, what can we do more? I've got guys in my, my group who want to help. And he, and he said, well, you can organize a local meeting. Maybe we'll have a meeting in London. And he said, well, why don't we call these chapters? You can have a chapter in different cities. You can have students or, or groups who come together and, and organize a, a half day, perhaps, a particular scientific theme or something else around the community, a, a cozy theme. But it, you know, we don't have money to give you, but we can give advice on how to get funding from your institute or your national government, your council or your national service council. We could also do it in silico, that's much cheaper. So in silico interactions, actually I, I took part in something at the beginning of the year, which was a really nice new format. There weren't lots of talks, you know, guest by PowerPoint. There was just a set of questions. We drew them up. It was about how how you validate a particular algorithm or type of algorithm. And we came up with sets of questions in advance. And then for each question, we had short talks from a few experts, like five, ten minutes. But then most of the time was in breakouts, two breakouts, and you think that doesn't sound too good, but actually was a lot of fun. And at the end of it, we put together a white paper around this. So I mean, any ideas that you have like that, or any time you have to organize something like that, would be really grateful. I mean, that would really serve your society and uh, help us expand our connections. So I think a uh, couple of other things that end with, what else can we do? I just want to thank Alex for setting up this ICD Green community. We're already trying to make a conference more green. Um, we have this growth. You know, if like me, you have to fly all the way here and you'd like to offset your, your carbon footprint, then you can donate, you can put some trees in that growth. Um, you can look at the pledge, there are lots of ideas on how to become more green. Any other ideas you have, again, please write to Alex, please let us know. I'll get involved in this community. And um, one last um, idea, and that's about how can we improve our communication as a society. So not just with each other, uh, but also with other societies. How can we engage with wet, wet sort of experimental biologists more? How can we engage with the public more? And again, here I want to thank Thomas for taking on the, the role of this new committee, the new, this new committee sets in society. And last year we had a session on, on journalism and the challenges and the benefits of scientific journalism. And we'd like to have more webinars around this. Uh, I, I don't know what the themes, I've just got a couple of images there. One, because people are always asking me about genetic engineering. And is it safe? And why should we do it? And, um, is it going to help us make crops more resistant? Or is it going to cause all kinds of problems in the future? So you can imagine a debate or dialogue around that. Also AI, people are quite, some people are quite scared about that, what it means. So I think our society could have a role in, in perhaps communicating with the public more on these issues. But again, we need help. We need volunteers who are interested in doing this kind of thing, engaging with the public, and working with Thomas to set up these types of activities. So um, I'm sorry, this is a, not quite the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> but um, anyway, these, these are the things that we need help with, and you know, we're, we rely on you, the other society. Um, please, um, if you have any time, or any ideas, perhaps the most important thing, if you don't have much time, just give us your feedback. What should we do more of? What could we do a bit less of? And that'll be really helpful. Um, I don't think I. I mean, I know we're, lack, we're short on time, so we just Anyone? need to set the scene. What's going to come after me are the people who are actually doing a lot of the work in the society. So working on the DEI committee, working with the COSIs, the journal, the student council. Those guys are going to come up here now and tell you, or ask, um, tell you a bit about what they do, but wait for your questions. So I'm, I'm going to hand over to them now. I don't think the first one. Well, we're lucky because Thomas said, I'm definitely using slides. So this is the next one, we're all set to go. I'm going to invite Thomas Lingauer and Alex Bateman, both one. What do you want to, what do you gentlemen want to do?
uh, to talk a little bit about, um, wow, I'm really wearing this mask with style. Um, <laughs> talk a little bit about bioinformatics advances. ISCB's new journal that we launched last May in partnership with OEP. So I will turn it to you. All right. Just click okay. the advance button. Okay. Oh no, you stick in that. I don't know if this is working. All right. Sunday. I think it is and Diane. Give it a try real quick. Hello. Oh no. Nope. So thanks Diane. Um, I want to spend a few minutes to inform you about our new journal, Bioinformatics Advances. For us, it's not so new anymore. It's uh, more than 15 months old. We've been working on it since the beginning of uh, 2021. It's gone online uh, on May 12, 2021. So it's over a year. It's been a nice ride, not rocky at all. Um, and, uh, uh, this is it, brother. This is a bit forward. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so the first question we have is why do we need a new journal? And what's particular about this new journal? And uh, we have a little bit uh, of a business card that, that the uh, uh, OUP, our publisher, prepared for us, which tries to put the stated point in, points together. And I think quality or high quality of research, um, I wouldn't put that on there because that's a given. Without high quality research, rigid, uh, rigid review, and this is what we're doing. Um, you can expect from us just the same high standards that you have from the best other journals that you know. But in addition, um, here are the following points that we feel are particular about our journal. First of all, for our society, this is our society journal. We never had one, we only have one now, and this is it. So I hope that all of the members should feel especially warm for this journal, um, simply because of that point already. Um, then we have an online only journal, so it's very accessible. There are open access charges to it. If you're a member of the society, you get a rebate, substantial rebate on these open access charges. Um, we also have a wide distribution of uh, scope. So if you've asked, ask what's the scope of the journal, the scope is that Anything that gets us excited as a community, uh, which means methods, method development, but it also means applications, and it also means emergent areas, things that are new. Um, if you feel, if, if you have something that you think you want to publish, um, that you think fits in the scope of the society, but you find, don't find it in the subject categories of the journal, put in a pre-submission inquiry, and we're extremely flexible. We want to hear emerging ideas from you and pick them up rather than send them to you, communicate them to you, what you what we think is emerging. Um, the other thing is that we are taking uh, great action, great uh, emphasis on diversity and inclusion. And I think, I don't actually know how many other journals this are doing, but if you want to uh, know what that means, is um, you just have to look at our Associate Editor Board. So we're looking at uh, diversity in all respects, except for excellence. We're not diverse regarding excellence. All of them have to be excellent. But other than that, diversity of topics, diversity of regions, diversity of backgrounds, diversity of gender, diversity of seniority. All of that, pack that into eight people. We think we did a good job, but it's for 12 people, I guess it is now. We also have an editorial board. Those are more the trustees of the journal. They don't do the routine work, but they oversee things and are consultants and hopefully also multipliers and ambassadors for our journal. So this is a team and uh, we thank the team for their absolutely great work that we're doing. Oh, I'm, I was missing one point that is important to us for the journal and that's author-centric processing which means the author is not the slave of the editor, but the editor is the slave of the author. So um, we want authors to be happy, not because we say yes to everything, but because everybody thinks that they are treated fair and with respect. And also the feedback that we get from authors shows that we are on the right track there. All right, here is um, a little bit of statistics. So these are the cumulative uh, um, numbers of submissions. You see basically a linear curve there, which means a constant rate of submissions, so about four submissions 
per, per week for first submissions. We've had 20, 204 submissions in the first year, uh, and a 50% acceptance rate of 66 papers. That is about twice of what the publisher expected us to do in the first year. So we're about a factor two above our expectations. Um, a profile of the accepted papers also shows you the regional distribution. Of course, we have we have a, 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 a majority of papers from the traditional Western countries because the field is structured like that. But I want to point out to you that we're also uh, um, trying to bring in uh, the regions that are not so well illuminated. Uh, we have three papers from Africa that we have uh, accepted, and we have one paper from the Caribbean. I don't know what shows up here. And we are interested in bringing in papers from regions. Uh, we also have a feature track, which is more like uh, a mirror of the society life. That feature track has to be um, has to be developed. Um, we only had two sad features there, which are both in memoriams of people who passed away from our community, and we want to bring that into a little bit more positive issue. So if you if you have um, um, substantial information that you want to communicate to the society and not, not just ICB but to the uh, bioinformatics computational community. Again, send us a pre-submission community. We're open to uh, hear your point. And we have already had some contacts of the student council uh, who has some issues there, education papers, uh, things like that. Um, feel free to be creative and let us know. Um, in order to jump start the survey journal, and this is really where uh, the accommodations go to Alex because Alex was the brain behind this. Um, we installed a transfer process from bioinformatics, where the sister journal of OUP bioinformatics in that respect. Now, uh, I hear, and we are also available at the OUP stand if you have questions in the, in the next days come uh, in the breaks, in the morning or in the afternoon break and talk to us. And one question that I get is, well, then you're a secondary journal because you get all of these papers that bioinformatics rejects. Well, let me tell you that that is not uh, the argument that you should have. Because first of all, there are two differences. First of all, bioinformatics is a print journal. A uh, print journal has a severe limit on volume. So they reject papers because they don't have space, not because they're bad. And they send them to us, and we have very speedy processing because we're taking their reviews. So we basically, save one round of reviewing as compared to if you resend your paper to any other journal. And typically, people are very happy with this process. And up to this point, I have to say that the majority of papers that we publish are still from this uh, from this transfer track. We also have original submissions, of course, but these have to be picked up and. The, the publisher uh, has this in mind, and the professional publisher. We know how these things go. You have a rising curve in the beginning, and so we expect the original submissions at some point to overtake uh, to overtake the transfer. Um, so, um, if you have a bioinformatics paper and it gets rejected, first of all, don't become sad because your paper is probably is not a bad paper. And they offer the transfer to our journal, be happy because we will be happy to take your paper and process it very speedily. Right, so what are the next steps? We want to grow the submission rate with the linear submission rate, with the constant submission rate, linear submission curve. We are in our expectation curve for the next year, but then we have to have to grow and increase submissions. So the best way to do this is by having you submit to our journal. Right. Um, um, Christine said before, mentioned a few things in which you can help the society. Submitting your best work to this journal is one of the best ways to help the society. Um, we also want to strengthen uh, the connection between the journal and all the other aspects of this life of our society, the committees, the um, student council, and so on and so forth. We can talk about collections. There are no special issues because this is an online only journal. We only have one issue per year, but we can have collections. We can have special projects and 
um, get in dialogue with us and uh, we'll be open to discuss things. Um, we also have transfer processes from ISMB. So if you had an ISMB submission that got marginally rejected, you got an offer to, uh, to uh, hand it into our journal. These submissions will not be labeled as ISMB submissions because that would implicitly mean that we communicate that you didn't make it into ISMB, which you know, is not what we want. But I can tell you, uh, it's just you among us, that uh, several of the ISMB rejected papers have already made it into the journal before the conference. So we've had this transfer process completed with revision um, for uh, a couple of papers. Um, yeah, and we are looking forward to getting listed in PubMed. I personally have no doubt that this will happen. And the only hurdle about this is that PubMed has to get into gear to process our application. They have basically closed shops since the beginning of the year. We're waiting and are hopeful that our will be listed before the end of the year. So here's what you can do. I already mentioned, um, submit your best work to the journal if you get rejected from bioinformatics series or consider Transferring, it's not just a, you know, a, a nice uh, uh, gift for us, but it's also of your benefit because we're doing speedy and professional processing. If you get asked to review for the journal, you should feel really bad if you turn that stuff, okay? <laughs> and especially if you're a member of the society. I want to inject pain in you. <laughs> okay, and we have some language in the review invitation that helps uh, to this <laughs> goal. Um, and uh, also try to spread the word about the journal into the broader community. Thank you. So Thomas, thank you so much. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, Terry has one. All right, Thomas, you got 30 seconds to answer this. Alex, <laughs> Thomas, you got 30 seconds. And yeah. I really want to thank for setting this up to cast the net broadly. And I'll give you an example and ask if you have any others. My disease area that I work in is ophthalmology. By definition, that's really tiny impact because the field is small. If I worked in cardiology or in cancer, much broader impact. So I want to applaud that you're casting this net broadly. And I hope that you're thinking of other examples. So for example, bone-eating whale worms. <laughs> Do you have other examples? That didn't come to mind yet, but um, <laughs> we want to make the point that, first of all, we're completely synonymous in everything, okay? Um, so don't try to play us against each other, you'll be the loser. Um, the other thing is that um, we're not looking for impact, we're looking for excellence and good quality and not looking for impact. So if you think that your excellent work but you're not sure whether it's going to be cited 500 times. It doesn't matter. Just excellence is what we want to see. Yes. So I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to move on. But Thomas and Alex are going to be right here. So if you want to chat with them, uh, they can have a conversation right there. And if it's really, really, if, you, if it's something um, that you want us to publicize later, just touch, touch base with us and we can put it in the comment section of this. So and we're also the, at the OUP stand. Yeah, uh, so my apologies uh, to our participant there and to you as well, Ali. Uh, so next up, we're going to learn a little bit more about ISCB's equity, diversity, and inclusion work. And we have the pleasure of being joined by the committee chair, Lucia Pichotto. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, this pleasure. My name is Lucia Pichotto, and I have no slides. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what I do and why I do it uh, in the spirit of, of sort of having more time for having being asked questions. I'm an assistant professor at the College of Medicine at Washington State University. As Diane said, I co-chair the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee of the Society together with Laura Spencer. I'm also a member of the Board of Directors currently. And uh, I have a long history of the society, actually. I was the Board of Director of Representatives from the Student Council Symposium in 2009. I've, uh, in, I've grown in the society and I went from being a computational biologist to merging into biology. And when I was thinking about what I want the society to be, to me, equity, diversity, and inclusion are really important. 
And if you want change, then you need to be the change. So that's why I accepted this responsibility to help the society with this effort. As a little bit of a background, this grew from an equity, diversity, and inclusion task force that was formed when Thomas here was president. The, the committee was formed in Basel in 2019. And we've been doing a lot of work since then, but obviously we also need help and we also need feedback. So fire away then. All right, Lucia, here's the toughest one. We've gotten a lot of feedback from our audience lately about why does ISCB ask the question about your diversity and what are we going to do with that information? Yeah, and this comes from, as you probably know, that when you complete your profile yeah. now, there is demographics survey that the committee has put together to actually collect data on how diverse our society is. Okay? So if you think about diversity and equity, you cannot actually talk about equity if you don't know how diverse your population is. So the purpose of, uh, of actually having data is that we can have data based or data driven decisions about whether what we have or the awards or the honors we bestow or the things that we we say we value whether they are being equitable relative to how diverse our society is right? and this needs to be data driven because first we are a data driven society right but also because we need to make objective decisions does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it definitely does. And I'm actually going to ask the audience if anyone has any thoughts or questions that they have about the ISCB initiatives that we're going with. And if you don't, I got a follow-up question. We got one back here. I took off my heels. For those who knew me earlier, there was a it's getting a little painful. <laughs> and you can say it loudly and I can repeat it. Yeah, I think I think I might blow the roof off if I use a mic. <laughs> so my question is the follow-up to that. What happens after those data are collected? Because that's you know, if you read Twitter, that's like the biggest criticism of PEI initiatives. Everybody collects data. What happens after that? Okay, well, thank you for the question. So the question is, okay, we collect data, what do we do with it? So, so, so there's two things uh, that I want to highlight. The first thing is starting last year and very soon we're going to have a new release. We have actually released an annual report in which we make this data available to the society. And we have the, the state of the society within that data, but we also have the data regarding all the honors and awards that we are giving, right? And how they compare relative to uh, the society's diversity. So one of the things that we are doing is trying to ask the tough question are we being equitable and inclusive in our recognition? And that is going to be released pretty soon, uh, so you can actually take a look at it and then tell us what you think about it. Right? The other thing is, in parallel with this initiative, we are actually uh, overtaking a variety of things that we have done at the same time. They are also included in the report, but I can tell you a couple of the things that we have done. We have established the ICD Code of Conduct. We have actually started an initiative called Safe ISCB, which is a safe space for people to report when they don't feel comfortable with the conference, which sometimes is not that easy. We have created a webinar series to feature diverse voices. Last year was Indigenous Voices in Computational Biology. It was extremely well attended. So we are using the data to actually drive decisions. And also, we are using what we hear from our members to actually try to start initiatives. And can we always do more things and better? Yes, but one thing about that, we need people to do those things, right? So we are, and so if you have something that it is important to you uh, in this space of diversity and inclusion, and you want to reach out to us, that's great, but be the change, right? It's even greater if you actually tell us what you want to do and volunteer to do it. So Lucia, good. thank you so much. And I have to actually apologize. I had a beautiful slide for you. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> uh, no, but I don't have slides. I <laughs> but I have one for you. So Lucia, thank you so much. I believe Lucia is going to be with us um, for the duration of the conference, kind of around and about. What's your plans? I'm actually leaving Thursday evening. Uh, but Otherwise, you can, you can find me, uh, talk me, say hi, 
and tell me what you think. We also we have at edi.icd.org is the central place where you can send us. Awesome, thank you so much. And if, again, she may be able to hang out tonight. I don't know what her evening plans are. So next, we just want to get to know our cozies a little more. Christine set the stage with this. Um, you know, we started way back before I was even part of ISCB with only nine cozies. Then we grew to 17, and now we're at 21. And they're incredibly complex communities. And we, we often call them the heartbeat of ISMB once we did our reorganization in 2017. So I have the pleasure of being joined by two of our cozy reps. Tiana and Francisco to just give us a little bit of the insider leadership on how those communities are developing and ways that you can get involved and how you can generate ideas. So whomever wants to go first, why don't you tell me a little bit about your community, the structure and how you see that, how you're impacting globally computational biology. But um, I've been um, involved with the HITSIC track for quite some time now. I think we started in 2008, as I say. And, you know, we obviously participated in this transformation where the SIC became mainstream as part of the conference. And, and definitely one of the things that we're trying to, to do is, you know, channel all this enthusiasm that the community has in that particular topic. I think we've been quite successful. And one of all the things that we're trying to do now is how do we expand what we're doing outside the conference? And that's something that we're going to need also your help, as well as your help if you want to become part of the leadership of the courses. So that's something that all courses are looking for new leadership. And we can only do this if other people want to take over the job that we've been doing. We don't want to be doing it forever. And, um, and hopefully, more people is interested if they want to change something in the course, you know, with the what topic, what other activities in particular we can do. We are, we're eager to hear what you want to do with that. And I'm going to just tell you a little bit of experience that we had in some experiment, right, to see how we can expand the activities of the courses. Um, during COVID, obviously, we stopped conferences. Uh, there was a new information coming related to COVID that required new methodology advances. And one of the things that I thought about it is, you know, in the Bay Area, where I live in San Francisco Bay Area, we have this bioinformatics uh, bio forum that has existed for many years, originally as a mailing list, now it's one of these meetups that you can see on the middle app. And I thought to the organizer of that, that it was kind of sporadic every couple of months. Why don't we organize a session of COVID? And by the way, this is a session that is going to be Officially sponsored by CP in particular by Kitsi. And we did it one day, uh, uh, sponsored also uh, through the Sun of Stanford University. It was very well attended virtually, and we got the word out that Kitsi exists, that the society actually is a venue for this kind of thing. So I think if we can think about more things like that, we're going to start expanding the impact of our courses on the Society of Computational Biologists across the world. Thank you. That's great, Francisco. And Tiana, you're with NetBio, right? A little bit smaller than HITSEEK. So how have you been navigating the challenges of finding leadership and new ideas as, as you've explored your cozy? Let me just introduce myself beyond just being uh, one of the chairs of NetBio for several years now. Uh, I'm also um, cozy representative of the board of directors of ICP. So it could be less questions about it. Basically, I'm representing all the courses uh, and implementing the board of directors. And this year, I've acted as um, area chair for the proceedings papers uh, for systems technology networks. So that's kind of my SMB side of scientific programming uh, here, complementing what courses do. So I kind of wear multiple hands, and I'm happy to answer any more of the questions. So we got you and then sucked you in even more? Oh, all, all, all on my own terms, yes. No, I, I, I'm happy to participate. And uh, really, I feel honored because on multiple levels, I feel like I get to drive in the field, at least central biology field is going, um, and helping cozy communicate with the board about important decisions. Um, from that bio perspective, uh, I've been kind of moved past roles eight plus years ago. In the last three or four years, I've taken on uh, one of the key leadership roles. And uh, I don't know, I think most of the people here, we're missing students. I was hoping we'd have all the students so we can communicate to them um, what, what's going on. But um, there's a number of roles 
lots of utilization techniques as happen from six special different groups to causes, and then even within causes, what are the formal roles that exist now for cozy tractures to um, cozy representatives for each of the causes to uh, cozy proceedings in New Zealand and so forth. So there's numerous roles within each cozy and we need people. And I think within that bio, I can tell you this, there was a discussion last year between all of the uh, people that have been here for on the cozy for three years now. We are kind of getting tired <laughs> and really want to at least get half of the new people. And I advertised during last year's, well, last in-person man final <laughs> that we need volunteers and we've got nobody to email us and express interest. And these are amazing opportunities to start establishing leadership so that eventually you could end up on the board of directors should you choose to do so to really help with some high impact uh, decisions. So I'll, I'll stop here and I, I do love to get questions rather than us talking about our agenda, right? Yeah. Ask us questions if you have any. I got it. She's still wearing her I think high I shoes. My question is related to something um, Christine said earlier about having local chapters of COSI. And so, you know, I think it would be great if there could be guidelines on how that could be established just something to say you know just some basic things that you think would be good to start out with so that's the comments my second question was um that you know there are groups that exist locally you know i'm part of this uh, bio, women in bioinformatics group in boston and you know we both organizers there and we would love to sort of work with um with the cosies or ISCB and kind of you know connect somehow and I know Francisco you talked a little bit about that so just some ideas on how existing groups can also link up thanks you know I, I think it's great that if, if we the members of the society can involve the other groups that we participate in the society you know the hit the the hit the causes are a little vertical they are topic based but even if your group that you participate is not particular uh, aligned with the clothes, I think they can still be aligned with the society. And it's up to us to really uh, not only tell them, you know, why it's important to be aligned with society, because, you know, you're going to get all these benefits that we were talking about. But also we need to think about what are the benefits that society can provide to those groups, you know, if, if professionally for them, but also locally uh, when they organize. And one of the things that, for example, we were thinking is that if we got regional meetings for these courses, it's kind of a path for them to then come to the conference. And maybe what it was a spontaneous talk in a local meeting could become later a paper for the proceedings of the conference. So I think that, you know, we don't have guidelines yet. Maybe we should be thinking more about that, but we want your suggestions on that. And I think that if you have an idea like that, like I want to involve my local group. We will figure it out. I think Francisco really um, hit a lot of my thoughts on the head there too. And, and what we find challenging from an operational perspective is we don't always know that these other groups are out there and being very active. And you don't always know which codes you may belong to. And I think maybe it's just making some bridges of connection and working together. You know, I was so pleased earlier this year there was a group. Um, that came to me, um, Open Box Science, and I'm like, hey, we have a lot of very similar things. Is there anything that ISCB could do to help us and us to help ISCB? And I didn't even know they existed, but now they're part of Nucleus, and they have a whole channel within the ISCB Nucleus, our new SANA Center for Science, Training, and Collaboration. <laughs> so if you haven't checked that out, please do. But it really is about making connections. You know, I joked earlier about we saw two thirds of our staff three people, it really is. We're four people. So it's really challenging for us to really go out and think about growth and connecting if we don't have that connection back. So please, if you are a group that wants to connect with one of our cozies, wants to set up a meetup, a regional chapter, I call them cohorts, because chapter is actually quite a legal term. So, um, oh yes, and please, please, uh, to be an affiliated regional group as 
the Boston Women Bioinformatics. We have that program too, which we touched on last year, but we didn't um, we didn't touch on this this year. So I do not want to cut student council short, but I know everyone's going to bail on them come exactly 7:30 for their dinner reservation. So I'd like to invite Gonzalo up to the stage to talk a little bit about our student council for all those PIs in the rooms. Please get out your notepads so you can start taking copious notes. So you can go back to your students and tell them how they can get involved. All right, Gonzalo, how are you doing? How do you feel, bud? Well, awesome. Woo. I think I'm going to repeat many of the things I haven't said. So first of all, Lucia stole some words from me. I also grew up in the society, and that's why I'm committing a lot of my time because I, 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 I see the benefits of all the people that have been working for us since I am an undergrad. So now it's a pleasure for me to be here as a board of director of Racing Street for the So uh, this is a, I, I come from Argentina and I created, I co-founded the RG Argentina in, in 2012. It took me 10 years to be here. So <laughs> it's, 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 but it, it, it was worth it. So, oops. Okay. So first of all, um, we have a new executive team since January this year. Uh, it's an amazing group of people. I'm the only old one staying, so um, it's, it's been a lot of work because we need to get our new dynamics, but they are all amazing. And actually, Gabriel is here, our vice president. Is, uh, we met virtually in 2014, and this is the first time we meet in person, so it's, it's also very nice. And of course, I want to thank our previous team in the second row, from which I was the, the vice chair until last year. So uh, thank you all of them for, for all the good work. Uh, also, we have uh, an organization of committees. We have uh, our education and internships committee, our RSG uh, student groups uh, organizer, uh, the web committee, outreach and volunteer, and our treasurer. We are a global and diverse uh, community. Uh, we have a lot of people all over the world, so it's, it's really complex to, to be part of the student council because sometimes it seems like, yeah, we are students, yeah, but we are a lot of people and in a lot of places doing a, a great variety of things. So I will show you some of the things we are doing usually, especially this year. So first of all, we, have, we are trying to restart this project, which is we have a program for internships. So if you're a PI and you have some spare money and you have maybe some place that you could use to have a student in your laboratory in your group, you can contact us because we have a program since many, many years in which we take applicants from all over the world, especially from developing nations. We make the pre-selection for you, so they send all their CVs, letters of recommendation, and so on. And we select the best, best, best students for you, and then you do the final uh, decision. And all of the people have, that have hosted students, they all have been very, very happy with them. So if you do have some money, if you do have space, please contact us because we, we help you in the whole process. Um, from the web committee, we have uh, Spencer and Wim. They have been involved since very, uh, quite a few years already. They are amazing uh, people for this, this team, but we need more volunteers. A new uh, website is, is going to be released soon, but also they take they take care of setting up all the websites for all our activities, our symposiums, and so on. So if, again, if there are interested people, you can contact us to be part of this committee. Then we have our finances committee. We have a, a funding call every year. We have three funding calls every year, and we try to, to fund different activities around the world, apart from our flagship events that are the European Student Council Symposium, the Latin American Student Council Symposium, and the Student Council Symposium that has happened this week. And on top of that, we have funded four uh, global events. Um, let me read a little bit. So we have funded, we have funded uh, an event in Italy, uh, the, 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 the Italian Symposium. We have, uh, for the first time, funded uh, uh, a, a Spanish-speaking event that was a, a collaborative uh, effort between more than nine RSGs around the, uh, in Latin America plus Spain. We have also funded a, a webinar series in India and a symposium for RSG Turkey. Also, we are trying to work hard on our outreach activities. We are trying to improve our presence in, in social media.
idea, especially in Twitter, because it doesn't happen. It does, it's not in Twitter, it doesn't happen correctly. So we have increased our followers in Twitter by 300, and, yeah, 300 in last year. And we are trying to further develop our web webinar series, which is a quite successful program that has been started many, many years ago by RSC Turkey. And then it has been adopted globally by all of our RSCs and the student council in general uh, during the pandemic. So we have in total 58 little talks that are uploaded in our YouTube channel. And you are more than welcome if you have something you want to show, you want to communicate to the community, you can contact us and the webinar teams will set up everything for you from the, the date or the type or everything. I mean, it's really amazing and we have quite a broad audience. So it is it, worth it. If you have, if you're interested, please contact us and we will set up a, a date for you. Then we have our regional student groups committee. So Pradeep, it, it's one of our new incorporations. He coordinates all of the energies around the world and this is really, really a hard task. So uh, I, I, will, I will show you a little bit of this. So we have all of these student groups around the world. The green ones are new uh, groups or groups that were inactive and will have been reactivated. And the blue ones are the ones that have been active since they have been created. So it's in total we have 24. And yeah, they, they, they do a lot of activities and we highlight some of them. So, the Serum Council is, is, is growing and it's getting mature. We are approximating our 20th anniversary in 2024. So, for example, RSG Turkey has been 10 years old and they have released this article in which they have told, they have written their, their experiences in the last 10 years, especially, for example, they have created the webinar series and among other things. Then, for example, we have we have increased our visibility in Latin America, especially, for example, the last incorporations have been Venezuela and Ecuador, and this shows a little bit of our diversity. Venezuela is in an economical, complicated situation, so they were not able to pay the membership. So we gave it, like, we, we granted, the, the, we, we waived the fellowship, which was $20, which for Venezuela is a lot, and the only with that investment, Venezuela has fueled a lot of activities. For example, they started the first collaborative um, activity together with Ecuador, which was an activity in Spanish. Because in Latin America, speaking English is a privilege. Not everyone knows English when they start in the undergraduate level. So they saw this, this necessity and they organized this collaborative event in, in Spanish. And they have written also a, 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 an article about this and why it's important. They have we are going to submit it to Bioinformatics Advance, and we see we will see if the scope is, is, is good for, for it to be there. And this has fueled this new uh, activity, which is the largest activity that the Student Council has ever organized that involves nine RCs that are uh, speaking Spanish in the, in the nations. And we have uh, an amazing uh, set of, of, of posters and talks and keynotes all in Spanish, and it has been really, really successful. And this is why we have to increase our diversity because we now pay attention to one necessity, which is to have things in Spanish. We can do it in Portuguese, or we can do it for gender, or we can do it for anything. I mean, the student house is very complex and very diverse and want to represent all of the people that are in there. So we are working now because we see we were able to increase our visibility Latin America, but there are still some regions to which we are not reaching. For example, Africa and Asia, and we have taken note of this, and we are working actively in trying to in, in increase our visibility there. So if you know people in those regions, please put them in contact with us because we really want to get them on board. We are still trying to increase our visibility in some regions that were growing a lot, for example, the Nordic countries, and the Latin America I talk, but if you are in those regions or if you know people who are in those regions and want to get involved, also please put them, put them in contact with us. So we also have our main events every year, every year or every two years. These have been the activities we have conducted during the pandemics. All of them have written their highlights, so you can go to F1000 and see what we have been doing. But we have also had 
this year, now in this venue, well, actually virtually, uh, the Student Council Symposium that was organized by people from Turkey and from Chile. This is very important because the pandemic has allowed us to connect people that are geographically very far from each other. So the, the American Symposium was organized for people from Turkey and Chile. We, we have also an amazing team from very, very diverse regions. We have uh, Janet Thornton and Manita Sidnik as the keynote speakers. We also have a, a, a round table about open practices in, in science. We are having in September our European Symposium, which is going to be the first in-person activity in the, in the last three years. So please, please, please come. You, well, the, 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 the posters, uh, the absence submission has been closed, but then we can open it a little bit more. You're interested to submit. Uh, we have more than 100 submissions, but we need people to register and to come in person. It, that's, that, that's going to be amazing. So, we have already a very amazing team working on that. We have two program keynote speakers, Anna Conesa and Alfonso Valencia, who are going to, to, to give lectures for us. Also, this year in November, we will have our Latin American Symposium, which is going to be virtual because we we were not sure about doing it in person and not having the funds to, 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 to be able to, to do it. So we are going virtual this time and we already have a team to organize this event as well and we'll follow the general structure of all of our, our meetings. And yeah, we are also trying to organize symposiums in Asia and Africa. In Africa, we are having an already initial conversation with groups in there, but we need more people. And we, as I said, we are approaching our 20th anniversary. So in 2014, we had a series of articles in which a lot of people from the council were telling stories about the experiences that we have in the first 10 years of our existence. And maybe it's a good moment to see what are the lessons that we have faced uh, in the last 10 years as, as well. So maybe we can do this in, in, in the front advances as well. Um, and we need people to, to, to work in this article. So if you are related to the student council, please contact us because if you would like to offer one of these publications, for sure, there's a place for you. So get in touch. So as you may see, this is mostly a report, but also a screen uh, asking for help because we need people, we need to renew our, our leadership. So get in contact, get involved, and help us to build the new leadership for bioinformatics and computational biology in the future. Thank you. Gonzalo, thank you so very much. I think you know we have a lot of underlying themes today that ISCD wouldn't thrive without the many, many volunteers that have to be involved to keep this going on. And I so appreciate the student council, um, all the volunteers. I think when you look at it, it's probably close to 200 volunteers alone for ISMD which is absolutely amazing. So thank you for all you did there. Any quick questions for the student council? I think Gonzalo is here for the whole meeting till Thursday. Awesome, have a good time. So I think with that, we're gonna close so everyone can make their dinner reservations, but um, who wants to scroll in the back screen? <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to say thank you so much for attending. I promise I will be more available tomorrow and I'm sure I can convince Christine to spend a little time with me at the booth or any of our officers or directors um, there around. Please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We are very open to feedback. Um, just remember kindness first. And I will bid you a great evening and I'll see everyone tomorrow morning. <laughs>